Um, this morning we will have our uh, mentoring hour and uh, welcome to all those who are already here. Uh, we'll have many more joining in very soon. Uh, I'll be your host uh, for the mentoring hour today. I'm Deepika Samuel, one of the teaching faculty here. Uh, so as you know, uh, during the mentoring hour, uh, you're free to raise any questions um, and you know you can get clarifications for any doubts that you have uh, regarding uh, any subject matter that has come up in your classes or um, any questions that you have regarding the Christian walk, uh, regarding ministry matters, uh, anything related to the Bible. Uh, so this is your time. Uh, you can uh, raise up uh, the questions that you have and uh, we will try our best to answer your questions. Uh, so um, uh, we could get started. Um, maybe we could begin with a word of prayer. All right. So after that, uh, we can take up your questions. All right, let's pray then. Lord, we just thank you so much um, that we can come into your presence uh, any time that we wish. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that you are our guide, our teacher. And so, O oh Lord, when we come into your presence and we discuss uh, things pertaining to you, you are there, O oh Lord, and you guide our discussions and you help us to uh, gain clarity uh, re regarding the things that concern you and your kingdom. So I pray, O oh Lord, that in this class today, um, during this session, uh, even as we uh, discuss different issues, you would be there guiding us, uh, leading us, uh, helping us to gain clarity uh, regarding many things that may be uh, troubling us in our minds. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, um, maybe we can get started then. If any of you have any questions, uh, please feel free. You can either post it here in the chat or you could just, um, you know, unmute yourself and um, raise your question. Uh, we can go ahead. Yes. For those of you who are joining in just now, um, we've started uh, the session. So uh, please feel free to go ahead and uh, you know ask your questions. You can either post the questions in the chat here, or you can just unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and uh, you know speak out the question that you have. I'm sure that you do have questions. We all do, in fact. Um, it does not have to be anything profound, anything that I, you uh, uh, would like to know. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, uh, one uh, question from me. Um, so uh, recently, when we're having a Bible study, this is one of the questions which came. Um, so when we talk about the forgiveness of sin, uh, we know that uh, at the cross, Jesus finished the work for our sins and uh, we are eligible for complete forgiveness of sin. But there's also one verse uh, uh, which we read. I, I'm sorry, I, I cannot recall the uh, exact reference, but uh, it's talking about when um, people was uh, having a discussion with Jesus regarding casting of, out of demons and towards the end, um, Jesus was mentioning this saying um, the sin against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So um, how would, uh, what is the exact meaning of it and how would it apply uh, uh, for a for life of a believer? Uh, and what is exactly uh, the Holy, uh, sin against the Holy Spirit? Yes, uh, 
you are asking two questions. Um, one would be, what exactly is meant by a sin committed against the Holy Spirit, which is un, uh, which cannot be forgiven at all? Uh, and the related question is, um, uh, what? How would that affect a believer's life? Uh, in what yes. way would that be related to a believer's walk? So these yes. are the two questions that you have raised. Um, would anyone uh, in the pastoral team uh, take up this question, please? Pastor Selina, would you like to uh, yeah. address this question? Uh, thank you, Pastor Deepika, and thank you, John, for your question. I think it's in Mark chapter 3, verses uh, uh, 28 to 30, where Jesus says, uh, whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness. It's uh, basically because uh, we know that when Jesus was on the earth, he was 100% uh, man, and uh, he was fully God and fully man. Uh, but, you know, being fully man, he you know, gave up everything. Philippians chapter 2, we see that he gave up everything that, uh, you know, that had to do with him, uh, his, uh, his attributes or his nature of being God. And so he was fully man. And everything that uh, he did, you know, all the miracles that he did, he did to the power of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, uh, the healings, the deliverance, everything was what he did was through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when people were saying that, you know, he's doing it by the power of uh, Satan, by Belzebub, then, you know, that's talking, that is going against the very, uh, you know, uh, work, the redemptive work, the salvation work uh, of uh, God. And that is hitting at the very core of, uh, you know, uh, what God had planned, his redemptive work and salvation. And that's talking against uh, uh, you know, what God has planned and ordained. So, you know, that sin cannot be forgiven. Uh, so that is what is uh, mentioned here in... Uh Pastor, you have muted yourself. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you, Deepika, uh, for the opportunity, Pastor Deepika. Thank you, uh, John, for your uh, question. Um, so here, uh, uh, what uh, Jesus is uh, saying is uh, in Mark chapter 3, recorded for us in Mark chapter 3, verses 28 uh, to 30, where it says, Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, uh, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they had said he is an un he has an unclean spirit. So we know that when um, Jesus was on the earth, he was uh, fully God and uh, fully man. Uh, he was 100% man and he gave up all of his attributes or nature of being God. And uh, so we uh, see that he, you know, he, whatever uh, uh, science, miracles and wonders he did, he did it to the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and, uh, you know, so when people were saying that uh, he's casting out demons or he's healing people by uh, the power of Satan or uh, Beelzebub. They were basically talking against the very redemptive act of God, you know, uh, the very plan of uh, salvation that God had uh, uh, foreordained for uh, mankind even before the foundation of the world. So they're talking against the very, uh, uh, you know, heart of God, the very plans and purposes of God, the very, uh, you know, the redemptive act of God, his salvation uh, plan that he had. So, you know, uh, and that's why Jesus says, uh, you know, that sin cannot be forgiven because they are, they're going against the very redemptive plan and the act of God and uh, his plans and his purposes. Yeah. I hope that, sorry, you know, I kept uh, uh, giving the answer. I didn't know that I was uh, muted. <laughs> And oh, no, no, you uh, were. Uh, oh, yeah, we could hear you. It's just that around the ending, it kind of got muted and uh, we okay. lost track. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. but we, okay. yes, yeah. Okay, so then um, I just repeated the whole answer again. Okay, yeah. No, that's totally all right uh, because it kind of clarifies the issue. So, um, um, I hope that was satisfactory, John. I mean, uh, uh, did you get the answer that you needed, or is there anything more that you would like to ask with regard to this? 
Um, yes. Uh, so uh, this part uh, I understand. Uh, my the, the part which I really wanted to know is um, what exactly is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Is it uh, is it denying the work of the, the redemptive work, or is there, uh, you know, let, let's say in the life of a believer when he knows the love of God and uh, consider this example itself when Jesus uh, casted out demon uh, and people said he is not doing according to the spirit but according to uh, Beelzebub. So even now when we see some people when they cast out demons, if someone says that oh, this is not by uh, Holy Spirit but this is uh, by another uh, spirit or an, uh, a demon, would that be considered as blasphemy? I, I just want to be a little more specific uh, in that. Just want to know about that. Thanks. Uh, anyone else would like to um, answer this question? Just to add further clarity to what has already been said. Yeah, from the from the text that we read, um, we see that uh, um, both in Matthew uh, twelve and also here, we see that they had actually attributed the works of. Uh, uh, at works, uh, they are, they actually uh, attributed the the whole miraculous and supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. They substituted that, and then they said that was the work of demons or work of Satan. And uh, and the Lord Jesus points out that uh, you know that cannot be forgiven. So um, uh, looking at uh, the text, we see that. Uh, uh, you know, we come to a conclusion. It was a willful rejection. You know, they were willfully rejecting the the work of the Holy Spirit. They 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 didn't want to receive. They didn't want to accept. And uh, I don't know. I'm just assuming maybe they knew this was off. You know, it was it was not of man, but still they were attributing that to Satan. And uh, you know, knowing the truth and rejecting the truth. Um, that would amount to blaspheming uh, the Holy Spirit and attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to a work of Satan. Uh, that would attribute to um, blasphemy. So, if um, you know, if I um, let's say for whatever reason, pride or ego, and I'm holding on to my position and I'm just defending myself, knowing fully well that it's a work of God, um, but still, you know, I'm I'm proud and uh, I just want to protect my position or worldview, and I continue to attribute that to um, the work of God, to the work of Satan, um, you know, I, I, I think we can conclude that uh, that would amount to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, sorry. Yeah. Thank yes, you. I mean, uh, what you're saying, Pastor, really makes a lot of sense. Uh, when we look at the overall context, you know, as mentioned here in the Gospels, uh, we see that again and again, Jesus is giving signs to prove and show very clearly that he is uh, the son of God, that he has come from God. And uh, all that he is doing is uh, doing uh, through the father, uh, through God. And uh, so after having given them so many signs to establish who he is, and um, if these learned people are still you know, resisting, and they are in fact going to the extent of saying, no, he is not of God, rather he is of the devil, uh, then um, I guess it would uh, truly be blasphemy because um, at their level, knowing all the Old Testament scriptures, uh, having heard all that he is saying about himself and seeing the works that he is doing, because in John, he clearly says, if you do not want to believe me, at least believe the works that I am doing, because it is, it, uh, the works were all so clearly pointing to the uh, hand of God. Um, and uh, so after having seen all of that, uh, like you said, Pastor, it's so true. After having seen all of that, if they are still saying, no, 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 this is not of God, um, it means that, uh, like you said, they are trying to hold on to their worldview and they do not want to uh, accept what Jesus is saying, simply because it would be inconvenient for them and um, uh, you know it would upset their balance of power and uh, their doctrine and all of that. So yes, uh, how would it pertain to the believer today? Um, now, the believers who are seeing miracles and signs and wonders, um, 
if any believer were to say, no, 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 this is not a work which um, the Lord is doing, but rather this is of some other spirit. Um, if they were to make a statement like that, um, now uh, it would depend, of course, uh, if they have been, uh, if they have made that statement prayerfully because they have uh, discerned the spirits and uh, have sensed through the Holy Spirit that this is not a work of God, then uh, the Lord would back them up, back up whatever they are saying. On the other hand, if it's just a careless statement that they are making without having um, relied on the Holy Spirit, uh, without really having um, uh, discerned the spirits through him, through his uh, guidance, if they are carelessly making that statement, then uh, yes, I suppose they would be held accountable for that. And the Lord would correct them in his time and he would you know, reveal the truth to them and um, you know, bring them back into the truth. Uh, so I suppose as far as believers today are concerned, yes, we are meant to um, uh, discern the works that we are seeing in front of our eyes. Uh, because there may be some who are operating not through the Holy Spirit, but through other spirits. So yes, we are, we are responsible for that, uh, to discern what is uh, being done. Uh, but it has to be done very prayerfully. Uh, it has to be done being very sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, uh, so that we can judge rightly uh, whether the work that is being done is through Him, through the Lord, or uh, through another spirit. Anything else at all that someone can add to this? Otherwise, you know, we can um, move on to another question. Has that helped, uh, John? Um, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Lina and Pastor Jakes. Uh, Pastor Deepika. Yes, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, are there any other questions that we can discuss? Yeah, please feel free to raise your questions. Uh, may I ask a yes. question? Please go ahead. Um, yes. Yeah, I happen to watch a video where a lady, it seems, she was a worship pastor, and but you know, uh, like uh, she was just sharing, like you know, like uh, she was possessed. How, uh, how, uh, how it was like? It seems it was in a delivering session. And uh, according to her, like she was hundred percent sure that uh, she does not have any demon inside of her. But you know, like one lady came to her and just uh, you know uh, started to pray and so on. And she was like uh, feeling awkward. Why this lady is praying for me? And I know I'm a believer, you know, and I can't be possessed. But you know, like as the uh, as she started to pray for her, you know, it seems um the demon started to manifest and the demon started to speak uh, and it says that uh, she's been possessed because uh, she uh, been uh, into some sites in internet where there was kind of uh she was kind of exposed to witchcraft so after watching this video I was a bit kind of confused can a believer be possessed because according to the scripture a believer cannot be possessed or like was she oppressed or how did this manifestation happen? No, so I was kind of curious and I was just kind of confused. So I was, um, so I just want to share this. Yes, it's a very valid question. Um, so uh, the question being raised is, can a believer be possessed uh, by demons? Is that possible? And uh, does the Bible say that a believer cannot ever be possessed by demons? Uh, these are the two questions that are being raised. Uh, would anyone like to address this question 
from the pastoral team, please. Uh, yes, Pastor Deepika, can I share my thoughts? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Zeli, for that question. So, uh, Zeli, as we have uh, studied in the believer's authority, uh, a believer, a born again believer, uh, we know that you know being born again is a work of the Holy Spirit, and um, First Corinthians six nineteen, where Paul asks the believers, and uh, he says, "Don't you know that you, know, you your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit?" Um, he reminds the believers that the Holy Spirit is the one who dwells within a believer and uh, also the body of believers. So uh, here is what we know. While believers can be oppressed of demons, um, they cannot be possessed because they are possessed or in other words, filled or, or um, sorry, they, they have the residence of the Holy Spirit in them. Okay, so uh, a believer, a born again believer, cannot be possessed by a demon spirit. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside us, but yes, there are varying um, levels of influence that we can allow or we can open the door for demonic powers to influence us. They can op oppress and, you know, um, uh, they, they could even. Now, oppress a believer at a higher level where we generally use the term demonized, but we never use the term demon possessed for a believer. Uh, I hope that helps, uh, Yes, Pastor, thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Nancy. Add, yeah, yes, go ahead. Just yes, a go quick ahead. thought, uh, just to add to what Pastor Nancy shared. You know, in the Bible, when we, when we see, um, uh, of course, in, in English, we translate that word uh, as possessed um uh, but in the greek actually it's that word diamonadzomai which means um, under the influence of so um, like pastor nancy rightly pointed out yes um, we could be in varying degrees of uh, you know demonization or um, you know uh, uh, under the influence so a believer can be uh, you know, if I may use the word demonize, um, it can be an oppression, uh, some area, some thought process, even um, some behavioral pattern, you know, which the believer has opened the doors to uh, for the influence of the uh, of the demon to energize that, you know, like uh, maybe a, maybe an addiction, maybe, a, you know, like a compulsive lying kind of thing, um, which uh, or, you know, uh, um, habits like uh, pornography and other substance addictions and so on. So um, uh, the, the believer knowingly, unknowingly opens the door for the demon to energize that aspect. So so then you know, the, um, the believer can be uh, oppressed or influenced uh, by the demon, right? So, and like Pastor Nancy rightly pointed out, the demon cannot possess because we are, uh, you know, if you use the English word possessed, um, uh, well, to that degree, the believer cannot be demonized because uh, the Holy Spirit indwells us, right? But uh, yeah, when we look at the Greek, we see the word demonized, um, you know, I think that would be a right word to use yeah thank you thank you so much pastor jay kumar uh, did that help uh, zeli would you lean uh, would you like any further clarification uh, you can go ahead if you have any further questions regarding this matter um, yeah let us know um yeah i'm very clear now thank you pastor jack it really uh, clarify all my doubts thank you uh, yes, we have a person who has raised their hand, and we also have uh, a question which has been posted in the chat. Uh, now, as Sam you know, posted first, maybe we could address that question, and then Enoch, we will definitely get to your question. Uh, so, uh, addressing the question which has been uh, posted in the chat, uh, it's by Sam, and Sam is, uh, uh, you know, uh, confirming that he has learned a lot from the lessons which have been covered. Uh, in our Google classes and also on the e-platform. And uh, he has received a lot of clarity um, uh, after having attended all of these classes. Uh, but his um, uh, issue is that 
he is unable to retain all of this information which is being given and uh, you know if you're unable to retain the information then it kind of becomes difficult to practically apply it in everyday life so he his question is how how do we retain it um, how can we um, remember all that we have been taught um, uh, so would anyone like to uh, you know address this question uh, please please do go ahead Okay, I'll just uh, share yes. my thoughts, uh, uh, Pastor Deepika. Uh, thank you, uh, Sam, for your uh, uh, query here. Um, just like to say that, you know, I'm just so excited to see your uh, interest um, in uh, attending classes and also to retain, uh, you know, whatever you've been learning. Yeah, there's quite a lot of information that is shared, uh, you know, in, this, in the three hours. There's quite a lot of learning that happens, a lot of information, theological truths that uh, we receive. Um, I think the best thing to do is, uh, you know, when you're following through the notes, just to underline the important theological truths, the new truths that you're learning. And then maybe at the end of the day, uh, if you have the time, I know all of you are also working uh, just to go through those uh, highlighted points, uh, which, you know, can help you reiterate what uh, you've learned throughout the day. Or maybe if it uh, doesn't happen, maybe you can, uh, you know, set aside some time in the weekend just to go through those uh, highlighted, um, highlighted notes. Um, and that would uh, also the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, teaching the same subjects, I keep learning a lot of new things. And uh, I basically jot down some things that uh, I have, I have forgotten or missed applying in my life, something that is applicable for my present situation, uh, or my present time now. And hence, what I do is, uh, uh, you know, I, I kind of write it down and then uh, I go back to it. If there's something that I can uh, use as a prayer point, which I can pray over my life, or over my situation, or people's life, or, you know, uh, just, uh, uh, you know, help in uh, growing in my prayer walk with God. Uh, so I, I, I write down as a prayer point, and then I use that as a prayer point uh, when I'm praying. Uh, that has helped. The other thing is, uh, you know, uh, for personal application areas where I need to apply it, I just kind of write it on because I also forget, you know, uh, uh, we all forget. So, uh, uh, so many things running in our mind, so many things that uh, so many responsibilities that we have to do. So just uh, write it down to uh, and keep reviewing those things, you know, uh, whether I'm following this and uh, applying this in my life. And I think uh, that has helped me uh, immensely. Uh, but always uh, going back, reading, uh, you know, helps us to retain. And also uh, jotting down points like this uh, just helps us to also uh, uh, you know, um, uh, to apply it in our own lives. And of course, you know, if you are uh, having a Bible study group or a life group meeting in your uh, in your home or you're ministering to children or you're ministering to youth or uh, people in your church, then you could you teach one of these courses uh, which you are studying or which you studied and, you know, teaching them again uh, uh, can uh, bring back, uh, uh, you know, all those truths that you have learned and uh, also help you in your walk, in your journey with the Lord. Okay, I hope that helps, Samuel. Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor Selina, for that uh, answer. And uh, yes, it's very true what you said. Maybe we could write down at the end of the day, uh, of each day, our takeaways for, for that day from whatever uh, lessons we have, you know, covered. So yes, that would be really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, so Sam, any any additional questions that you would uh, like to you know raise with regard to what has already been said? If not, we will move on to the next question. Um, oh yes, uh, Pastor Jay Kumar has uh, posted here. You know, revisit the lesson uh, and re release. Yes, in application, release in application. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, yes, Enoch, you have uh, raised your hand. Please go ahead with your question.
We have Enoch here who has raised a hand. Okay, maybe um, Enoch, you're there. Um, would you like to uh, ask your question? Or if yeah. you have accident, Good morning, please. everyone. Yes, go ahead. Um, it has been 40 a.m. in Nigeria. Good morning. And uh, I want to ask a question and also clarification. Uh, based on the last questions, the previous question before the last question, can a believer be possessed? A born again child of God, can he be possessed? Because I know if you are born again, genuinely born again, Holy Spirit filled. You pray, you study your Bible, and you see possible. We've lost you uh, at the moment. Uh, you're not okay. audible. We we did catch the first part. Uh, you know where you were saying that it is uh, not possible. Uh, for a believer to be possessed, and then you were saying about them reading the Bible, and then it kind of faded out. Yeah, if, okay, if you could okay. continue. Okay, okay. Oh, what I say is this: if you are genuinely born again, and you and you pray, how will and you are communicating with God? How will so possess? Is it possible for a born again child of God? Yes. That is my. Do you get me now? Oh. Yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm sure that we have, you know, caught the question. Yeah, you're uh, you're saying that a person who is praying and in uh, in communication with the Lord, uh, how could that person be uh, possessed? Isn't it? Yes. 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 Uh, well, uh, Pastor Jay Kumar, um, you know, uh, like he said, uh, and also like Pastor Nancy said, um, possession uh, is not possible because it is true uh, the person has been possessed taken over uh, by the holy spirit uh, they have uh, the, the person has committed himself to the lord jesus and uh, because of uh, the commitment that he has made now he has been sealed by the holy spirit and uh, so yes the person is now possessed by the holy spirit but the person still has their free will um, uh, to uh, you know act as they wish and maybe even open themselves up to in other influences if they so wish. So um, they are, like Pastor uh, Jay Kumar said, um, he the person may expose themselves to other influences, giving those other powers an opportunity to influence them and oppress them. Uh, so in that sense, um, um, oppression or demonization is possible. Uh, so. It, uh, both Pastor Nancy and Pastor Jay Kumar have touched upon that point. Um, so, uh, like you said, it is true. Uh, the person is now uh, sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, they have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Uh, but due to their free will, they can still uh, choose to watch a video on witchcraft, like uh, you know, uh, Sister Zeli was mentioning, or they can uh, choose to live in. Uh, sin consciously, deliberately, uh, allowing the um, the demons to you know work in their lives, uh, work through them. So these are things which they can do using their independent will, even though they have chosen to be in a relationship with the Lord. So because of that, there could be oppression, there could be a strong influence and control to a certain extent uh, over them due to the due to their own choices, the wrong choices which they have made. Uh, so in that sense, um, demonization has happened. But like both uh, Pastor Jay Kumar and Pastor Nancy clarified, um, 
possession as such would not happen in the case of a believer because the person has already been claimed by the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, these are the points which we kind of uh, went over. Um, so would those would that help, um, uh, uh, brother? Would uh, Enoch would that help you? Um, you know, in answering the question. Uh, yes, uh, at least to some extent. Uh, but I know. can give yeah. a free will. Uh, I can give a free will. Oh, that's fine. That's okay. Uh, yeah. Pastor Pitika, yes. just to add Please to what ahead. you shared. Yes. Yes, so there is uh, Ephesians 4.27, where uh, you know Paul encourages the efficient believers. He says, uh, do not give the devil a foothold. So again, you know the same thing that you talked about about having a free will uh, and uh, uh, allowing or permitting Satan to to uh, sort of influence us, and that could be through um, sin, that could be you know uh, in through various ways. So we can give the devil a foothold as far as uh, the word of God is concerned. So, you know, that's where the influence, um, you know, that we've been talking about uh, comes in. So just wanted to add that uh, point. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for the clarification, Pastor. Um, yes, uh, we'll maybe move on to the next question, uh, the one posted here in the chat. Uh, we have uh, John Paul asking uh, whether it is all right for a believer to participate in a, uh, in a religious program, a non-Christian program, like you, like the Navratri dances. It's like a cultural event, and um, you have a lot of youngsters who would like to be part of that. Uh, so, if you have a young believer uh, who wants to join her friends and you know participating in the dance. Um, and then, uh, what would should, what should be the decision of the parent? Should they allow uh, their Christian daughter to go and participate in this Navaratri dance, uh, which would, in a way, be glorifying uh, the forces which are being worshipped, you know, uh, in that particular event? Uh, so, would uh, what should be the decision of the parent? Should they allow it or should they not? Is the question being asked over here? Um, so, uh, would anyone like to address this question? Um, uh, uh, can I? Yes, yeah, please go ahead. Um, I want to. We are too joking with the Bible, make it very clear, touch not. Idols, touch not. Child of God, a genuinely born again child of God, should live for idol. The Bible makes it say, they that make them. If you they are doing a festival regarded to the idols and you are dancing. You are telling the idols, I am a part of you. That's, that's the pretendance in the sight of God. And God. I can imagine myself being a preacher and my children who allow that. That means I'm being. I'm telling the devil. So, such, no matter the influence, focus on God and let God. We can not to dance for idols. Yes, I caught most of what was being said. A few times the uh, volume kind of went off, but then I could catch what was being said. Uh, yes, you, you uh, like you said, uh, brother, um, we must not partake of anything that pertains to idols. Uh, and uh, so that should be one of the first uh, priorities that we should consider. 
uh, when we are you know deciding whether to do something or not so anything pertaining to idols uh, yes it would be a very firm and clear no for a uh, believer uh, anything else that uh, you know anyone uh, uh, from the pastoral team could would like to add please uh, because um, in india uh, it's true the navratri dances are something very popular among the youngsters and they do it more like a cultural thing uh, and they don't really think about the religious implications of it. Uh, so uh, would anyone uh, from the pastoral team like to address that, please? OK, Pastor Deepika, I'll just uh, share a few of my thoughts. Um, uh, actually, this Navratri is the nine days when the nine nights when they are, uh, you know, is dedicated to the nine goddesses of the Hindus that are worshipped. And of course, before they start uh, this dance and everything that goes on throughout the night, they uh, they they do worship the idol. Uh, they just invoke the presence of uh, the the, uh, the so-called gods or goddesses in that place, and so the 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 dance and the festivity uh, that is done there is basically towards that uh, uh, to that idol, and uh, uh, it's just actually uh, attributing praise and you know uh, worship. Uh, to that idol by what they're doing. So, uh, you know, as uh, yes, as uh, Christians, as believers, as, uh, it's a challenge, uh, you know, uh, especially to explain to uh, teens and to young people uh, because they look at it as more like a fun thing, an exciting thing. Uh, but we need to teach our children that, um, you know, uh, uh, if everything that we, whatever we are doing, you know, whether it's fun, whether it's entertainment, uh, or, you know, uh, uh, all the activities that we do, is it pleasing uh, to God? Okay, so is this pleasing to God? Because this is not basically being attributed to our God. We're not praising our God. We're not worshipping him, but we're actually uh, praising uh, uh, and, uh, you know, by dancing or taking part in it, we're taking part in what is uh, the demons or, uh, you know, the gods and so uh, the other gods. And uh, we read in... Um, in I think it is in uh, Second Corinthians chapter six verses fourteen and fifteen. It says, "Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Uh, what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an uh, an unbeliever?" Another scripture that we can uh, show uh, the teens is, uh, you know, from Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father uh, through him. Uh, so this uh, scripture verses uh, very clearly says that, you know, um, uh, that uh, we are not to be attributed uh, you know, attribute uh, 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 any of uh, our fun or entertainment, anything that is, uh, you know, to other gods or goddesses. But whatever we do, we do everything for the glory of God. Uh, so since this is basically doing it for uh, the Hindu gods and goddesses and invoking their presence and just celebrating uh, that and, you know, inviting, unnecessarily inviting, uh, you know, uh, demonic influences into our lives uh, uh, is not something that, uh, you know, is something that we can tell our children that uh, is not what God wants us to do. Uh, I, I also know that, uh, uh, you know, being a Gujarati, we uh, we do have uh, Dandia and Garba in our own uh, uh, marriages, but uh, all of the songs that uh, uh, people dance during our Christian weddings or believer weddings is all based on Christian worship songs. Uh, so that you know, that clarity is there. So even if you're dancing or doing Garba or Dandia, you know, it's all uh, based on Christian uh, worship songs. And uh, uh, so that also is, is clearly shows a divide between us as believers and, you know, uh, the songs that are played during Navratris or, uh, yeah, mostly uh, uh, movie songs, but also songs that uh, uh, are invoking the presence and worshipping uh, uh, the idols that uh, they are attributing their worship to. So it's a good time to teach our children that whatever we do, whatever fun or entertainment that we do, that whether it's glorifying God, it's bringing glory to God. Because uh, God is not being glorified there, then, you know, it's not something that we can take part in uh, or uh, be part of. And also we know that there are many 
many teenagers um, during this Navratri time get into a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, harmful uh, behavioral patterns and uh, many of them even uh, uh, you know uh, are molested or raped and uh, so it's good to also uh, show that part uh, to our children and uh, you know uh, as a protective measure as well i hope that helped john oh yes Thank you so much, Pastor Selena, for that. Uh, yes, um, like you said, uh, we would have to explain to them that they are not just doing a fun event, but they are, in, in fact, partnering themselves with uh, the evil one. So obviously, that is not something that uh, can be you know, encouraged or even allowed. Um, and uh, like you also said, there is another side to it, a dark side to it where uh, there can be dangerous consequences uh, even if they you know uh, indulge in something like that okay we lost EP. Okay. and also like you said uh, we do have our indian uh, dance forms and christians do uh, you know um, um, participate in Indian dance forms. But what music are we using? It would have to be Christian. It is not something. Uh, it would have to be music that is not dedicated to uh, other gods. Yes, most definitely we would have to keep that in mind. So even though we may be participating in Indian dance forms, what uh, music is being used, what the lyrics that are being used, strictly forbidden to a believer. So yes, um, uh, does that help? Um, yes, yeah, yeah. John Paul has posted that. Uh, yes, this is helpful. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions that uh, uh, anyone would like to raise? Uh, Sorry, we still have some time. Sorry to interrupt, Deepika, your uh, internet connection was a little weak in the, uh, so we couldn't hear uh, some of the things you said. Oh, no, I was just uh, you know, summing up what you had already said. Uh, so no, I did not add anything new. Um, uh, yeah, we've in fact, I think, run out of time. Uh, so yes, we can in fact conclude. Uh, maybe we can just, um, yeah, I think we would need to conclude because it's time. Um, uh, but if you have any more questions, you know, please join in uh, next time and we will uh, address all of those questions. Um, thank you. Thank you so much.